Hey, everybody, welcome to the Council Room uh, panel on British television, 1950s and 1990s, where we will spend the next hour doing an exhaustive history of British television. No, we're not going to do that. That would be far too meant, much. <laughs> meant it's exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> we, you will be exhausted when, when we're done. Uh, we're, all we're trying to do here today is uh, have a conversation about British television, uh, some, some of our favorite things, as well as uh, just being able to uh, have an open dialogue. We have some folks with us today that, uh, that are as interested as we are in British television. So for anyone who's, who's currently watching this recording, please feel free to enter your, uh, your questions or just comments even about favorite British television, whatever. The purpose of this panel is going to be more so of uh, kind of covering 1950s and 1990s. So I think a lot of us have probably seen a lot of the television from the 1970s to 1990s. Part of it is to kind of show some other, uh, other programs that you may have not heard of, we can learn from each other about stuff that we're really interested in. I've been watching this stuff for a long time, uh, but uh, there's some people who have been watching British television for a great deal of time, but are starting to get deeper into, you know, like the catalog of stuff that's available. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. First of all, let's introduce ourselves. Mike, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Mike Rogers and like Greg, I've been watching um... Uh, British television, especially from that era for quite a number of years, kind of grew up being introduced to it through PBS. Um, and I'm kind of here to represent the, the noob perspective um, because, I mean, even though I've watched a fair amount, I still feel like there's, there's vast chunks of it that I have yet to experience. And so um, I'm, I'm just here to enjoy and, and actually tap into Greg's knowledge because Greg, you've got like, I'm not sure if there's there's uh, very many other people in North America that really have, have been immersed in British television to the same extent that you have. Possibly. I mean, I don't, I don't have a life, so that helps quite a bit. Um, but um, my name is Greg Bakken, and I, am, uh, I run a site called From the Archive. It's a British television uh, vlog where I put YouTube videos up. I also do a podcast and I also do a blog. And the podcast I uh, do with a, another organization I work with called Kaleidoscope Television. And what they do, they're a British Television Preservation Society in the UK. And uh, one of the things that they love to do is find missing British television, something that I'd like to talk about at some point here uh, over the next hour. But, uh, you know, and, and you got to thank them for such finds such as the Avengers Tunnel of Fear find from a, uh, from a few years ago, which is really exciting. You know, I was talking with my friend Robert who is on here and he made a, a pretty cool suggestion, Mike. And what that was is that, um, talk a little bit about British television in terms of how it's a, a little different than what you get over in the US in terms of its background and whatnot. And I thought it was a really interesting perspective because I think a lot of us take for granted that, uh, you know, British television exists. And that <laughs> it's always, you know, especially when we started watching it, it's something that was sort of uh, sequestered mainly to PBS. It certainly showed up on commercial stations in different, in different forms. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of us really first sunk our teeth into this, you know, genre of television through watching PBS and whatnot, mm -hmm. probably mainly, you know, Doctor Who being a massive part of it. But, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, is really different than what was going on in the U.S. is the fact that throughout all of the U.K., uh, starting with uh, the first British television broadcast, regular service, I should say, which was in 1936, mm -hmm. it really, for, from... 1936 to 1955, it was one channel. That was the BBC, which is uh, BBC started as a radio service, of course, and uh, that was in 1923. And since you know, pretty much since its inception, they were working on trying to do a television service because television had been 
you know, in its infancy for, you know, a few years before that in the US and other parts. And folks like uh, uh, Logie Baird had been trying to figure out like what's the best way to do broadcast service. Uh, BBC started doing television uh, broadcast in 1932. Then they move on to a full service in 1936, apart from the war where they ended up, uh, you know, halting their service for a while. They return after the war and something interesting happens. First of all, as you all probably know, that everyone in the UK has to pay a television license fee. And back in the early days, radio license fee to be able to listen to BBC radio or watch BBC television, that stuff like it is here, it, it, isn't, it isn't, you know, free. So you had to pay the licensing fee to be able to watch. I mean, doesn't mean it doesn't mean it doesn't work if you don't pay it, but you know, there, there are things such as TV detector vans going around to see if there's houses that were watching it that were known for not, you know, having listed that they paid for it. But something interesting happened in 1955, and that was commercial television hit the UK with the start of independent television ITV. And within ITV, you have all of these other networks within it. Have you ever seen a show that starts with Thames Television? That's a network within ITV. Tons of programs were made there. Yorkshire Television, Aunt Anglia Television, all of these smaller southern television you know all these small places all these small networks created their own television programs in a sense being their own production companies and they were creating content and that started in 1955 and it's still going today so when you go from 1955 to 1964 you had two channels and that was bbc and itv and then in 1964 started BBC Two. And BBC Two was different than uh, BBC, then became BBC One, simply because it started running in what was basically at that point, high definition television, 625 line. Up until that point, uh, BBC television was in 405 line and it stayed that way on BBC One until what, 1967, something, something around there. But BBC Two, always ran 625 and then it was in 1968 that it turned to color and BBC One didn't hit color until 1970 so or 69 I guess you could say and so you know it it feels like you know a much smaller more compact story when you talk about the story of British television although it, there there is so much to it but it's it seems kind of digestible whereas in the US you have all of these, you know, you have the networks, but then you have all these independent stations as well as affiliates where it just a mountain of programming was needed. In the UK, it was pretty, um, it was pretty compact. And so you had three channels into the 80s and then finally started getting more channels such as channel four, channel five. And then of course you go into satellite television, you have BSB, UK Gold, all these other things where the channels start spreading. And that's where, uh, that's where really these, these uh, networks, ITV and BBC, start to look more into their own archives in a sense too, because suddenly, even though, even though you're still paying license, you, even though you're still paying fees for uh, you know, talent and you're still paying fees to license the programs, it was still in some ways cheaper to run something on cable than certainly on terrestrial channels such as BBC One, Two or ITV, but it's also, it was quick programming to get onto these fledgling stations and be able to have some kind of uh, programming. And you know, I only bring this stuff up. First of all, I bring it up because um, because I, you know, Robert brought it up to me earlier, and I think it's a really fun discussion to just talk about that. But also the fact that it's, you know, it is, a, it is an interesting story, Mike. It is something that, uh, you know, it, it kind of for us who've been watching this stuff, especially Doctor Who, and I always say Doctor Who is the story of British television. And what I mean by that is also how it's made, but also how it's broadcast. And it's kind of how we all became armchair armchair uh, technical uh, 
you know, people, uh, be experts in some ways, because we're so interested in every aspect of Doctor Who. And then from there, our love for this genre kind of grows. I always say Doctor Who is the gateway drug for British television. I mean, I, w am, I, am I off base there, Mike? No, you're not off base. Like, I, as a small kid, I can remember things like um, Faulty Towers, seeing it before Doctor Who. I can remember Monty Python's Flying Circus prior to Doctor Who. Uh, but you're right, it, it was Doctor Who that really just kind of like shot through the television screen and got me hooked on it. So it was more than just something passing, you know, as I'm walking through the living room and seeing mom and dad watch upstairs, downstairs, for example. Um, and and you'd have to say, I would assume too, like one of the one of the joys of watching something, say like the Avengers or mm -hmm. All Creatures Great and Small or something like that, from being a Doctor Who fan would be to spot the Doctor Who guest star in these episodes because exactly. it always made them, even though they're great series on their own, always made them a little bit more special. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and you hit the jackpot when you actually hit an actor who played the Doctor, right? Right. Like, that was gold. <laughs> I mean, you're going to see Philip Maddock in, in just about everything, but when you see Patrick Troughton in an episode of All Creatures World, then you got to take note. <laughs> absolutely no absolutely and that's the fun thing about that especially when you don't realize um when when some of these shows are mainstream that you're just like oh patrick trown in in all creatures great and small and merry gentlemen oh okay that's that's very cool but patrick trown in dr finley's casebook because it's something that hadn't been seen on television since its release never really syndicated except in for BBC Wales, or BBC Wales, yeah, uh, Simru. Mm -hmm. um, but when we have access to these programs that we may have not have access before because now they're becoming available, suddenly you're able to see one episode of Dr. Finley's casebook has Patrick Trown, who has a reoccurring role as a schoolmaster in it. And then an episode or two before it, you have a very young Fraser Hines in it, who's just playing, you know, a kid that um, is, is just part of the story. And, this is this is really important to us, you know, and and, you know, I it's an interesting question, Mike, but what do you think? Why do we want that connection with with uh, those those actors and seeing them in these different shows? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if it's just like you, you kind of build this this relationship in your head mm -hmm. where you see an actor and you see their performance and then, you know, you, you pick up on them in another program and, you, you know, it. Part of it, I think, is you just see them in a different light, a different perspective, which to me is like always the fascinating part to see like how they approach different roles. Um, uh, like seeing Peter Davison as Campion, uh, I just got that as a Christmas gift. I was watching a couple episodes of it. And I was like, you know, oh, I wish he played the doctor more like he played Campion. Um, yeah. So it's funny, like you, you do those kind of comparisons in your head, I think, for me at least. Yeah, I mean, and, and Campion is one of those great, you know, British television programs that uh, is what the BBC is known for, for taking, you know, period, period pieces and, and making them into something special where you, you do feel like you're immersed into this, uh, this world. Going to the chat room real fast, our good friend Matt sends through a list of programs that he's hoping kind of gets a mention. Um, in in the in this panel which is a lot of shows and there's a lot of great programs on here which are important to 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 mention you know he has on there uh you know adam adamant lives tomorrow people hitchhiker's guide hound of the baskervilles with tom baker box of delights i mean I, i'll go through them but one on the very bottom which kind of hits our our threshold of of this period of time we're looking at is queer as folk which i really felt was such a game changer uh, on so many levels. And I, Mike, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's 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 fresh storytelling. It's Russell T. Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, someone who, you know, it's, this has been going on for a while, but you got someone in here who is able to tell a great story, to tell a poignant story, to tell a story and bring a awareness uh, for homosexuality, but also to put in some of the things he loves like Doctor Who, and that's a big part of it, but it doesn't overpower the program. It's kind of a nod to us fans who are just love to get that sort of thing, but it doesn't detract from the story. And, uh, you know, I've even back in the, when this was out, when Queer as Folk came out, I heard people saying, 
wouldn't it be great if this guy could write Doctor Who? I, I remember that uh -huh. and thinking, gosh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll never happen is what I said. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a little bit to show how little I know about anything. Um, <laughs> well, doesn't it kind of also highlight the difference, the cultural difference in how the British um, approach um, their television making as opposed to, to US? Uh, just in terms of like tone, um, even in the structure of like, like, cause you think of American sitcom, they're going for quantity, right? They're, they're cr trying to crank out as many seasons as they, they can. Um, and for me, it just kind of becomes this long, vast ocean of the sameness. You know, you just keep getting, you know, the same episodes over and over. Whereas in, in the UK, uh, it's really different. Things are treated like, you know, we have shorter seasons or series. Um, fewer episodes, but I think maybe uh, a greater attention to the quality and the detail. Like I'm, I'm wondering if could Queer as Folk really have been made in the U.S. At the, in that same time, in that same era, to that it, same quality? Well, and it was made in the U.S. You know, it's one of those things that they they glommed onto the success and they made it in the U.S. And I'll, I'll be very honest, I don't know how it did because to me, you know, I. I'm not a big fan of a lot of remakes, apart from the Are You Being Served uh, remake, Beans of Boston. But, um, you know, the thing, the thing about that, and, and you know, you bring up a, a point that I wanted to talk about in, in the intro that I think is worth talking about too. You know, you talked about tone, you talked about uh, the way things are made. And I think that when you look at, not so much now, because they've certainly moved away from it, but when the BBC started, what you ended up having was a lot of, of uh, theater that was broadcast live, and there was a proper way of speaking English, and there was a proper way, it was, it was what I call television of the classes. You know, mm -hmm. you, it was very proper. You know, something like Nigel Neal coming along with Rudolf Cartier, kind of helped that a little bit, but not as much as people think. When you got ITV starting, suddenly it was, that was more speaking to uh, the, the working class. Mm -hmm. You know, the working class on BBC programs often looked like, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, Mr. Mash and are you being served? You know, kind of like, oh, get off the floor, Mr. Mash, you know, or they, you know, have their, you know, their Cockney accents and stuff where this was like, you know, stuff like Coronation Street, where you're looking at the, the lives of, of this working class and and it just you know was not always pretty uh you know it just there, there was so very different ways of of connecting and i think one of the things that came through that was uh something like till death is due part where um it was uh you know, that, that really, that generation gap, you know, it was like two generations in the same house living with each other and one, they're not understanding each other, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, I mean, you could do that any period of time, but when you look at something like Till Death is Due Part, it's the 1960s, you know, Britain was undergoing a massive, you know, revolution of culture and style and you had people working class who just they work themselves to the bone like you know elf garnet he went to the pub a lot but he was also he worked he worked he worked and he was working in a work he's living in a working class home unhappy in his marriage but he has this daughter who is just you know she's she is the you know the the poster child for the swinging 60s mm -hmm. and it's it's such a it's it was very it was it was actually powerful but while being uh, entertaining at the same time. So, well, and if I recall, um, till death do us part, is didn't that actually make a crossover into the U.S. market? On the like, family. Yeah. So I wonder, can you give us a quick rundown? Like, what are some of the the really popular British programs from that era that ended up successfully leapfrogging over? Like, you know, I didn't even know All in the Family was was linked to that until I started looking at closer to British television. I'm well, as, I like that. As Bill put in, uh, Man About the House was Three's Company. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the very first episode of Man About the House, or Three's Company, I should say, it is a complete, uh, it's, it's a complete remake of the first episode of Man About the House, which incidentally, uh, the Ropers was the same as George and Mildred, which Robin's Nest was the same as Three is a Crowd. So they just, you know, they went with the whole thing. As Robert put in, obviously Steptoe and Son, but there are two Steptoe and Sons um, remakes. Uh, one obviously in 
uh, the US was Sanford and Son, which was hugely popular. Uh, mm -hmm. The second uh, was uh, uh, in the 1960s, 1960. 566 was uh, Steptoe and Son. It was literally called Steptoe and Son. And it, it looked like it was made by the people who made the Munsters, you know, that very similar 1960s style uh, sort of sitcom sort of thing with the canned laughter and the, it all shot on film. And only one episode was made. And it, I, I didn't even, we didn't even know it existed up until about five, six years ago when Kaleidoscope was in uh, Galton and Simpson's house. They don't live together. I think it was like <laughs> Simpson. I make it sound like that. They, it's like Bert and Ernie. They like sleep in different beds in the same room. And you know, it's no, but um, Galton and Simpson are the writers of Steptoe and Son, the creators of Steptoe and Son for those who aren't aware. Um, but they're, they're going through, the, like they're looking at scripts and stuff and this is on film and and uh, one of the, the camera person, Rory, is like, what's that over there? And the, uh, the I, I think it was uh, Alan Simpson, or maybe it was Ray Galton said, oh, that's the US, that's the film print to the US pilot of Steptoe and Son that we did in the 60s. And everyone's like, what? <laughs> I had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, we, as Kaleidoscope, released that on DVD about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a very, uh, a, a very admirable attempt at the British uh, series. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but, um, you know, there's, there certainly was, was a couple and there's one that I, I seem to feel like I'm missing. Uh, that's very obvious, um, but uh there's a couple I'm missing. They're very obvious, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I mean, they they certainly have taken their 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 swipe at it. And obviously, stuff like I mentioned, "Are You Being Served?" It was remade over here. One episode of uh, called "Beans of Boston," and it's it's a very I think once again, it's a very fun attempt at um, at doing that. "Men Behaving Badly" was remade over here for a couple series. Um, Faulty Towers was made over here a couple times. Dad's Army was remade over here for one episode called The Home Guard, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, just, it doesn't always, doesn't translate all that well. Um, I think they were gonna try to do, obviously, yeah, Bill, The Office, very much so, yeah. Mm. Uh, they were going to, I think they were going to try to do Absolutely Fabulous with Roseanne Barr, weren't they? You know, so, I mean, they're often taking, you know, mm. A hint from the UK shows and trying to make it some successful, some not. So yeah, would it be fair to say most don't take it? that? That's certainly my impression. You know, you you think of the Red Dwarf US remake and and the others you mentioned, the Faulty Towers, and and I got to believe that there are a lot more misses than hits on that. You, you gotta <laughs> wonder what it is for something like Red Dwarf, for example, that just does not connect with you know, US audiences. And I think I can, I think we get pinpointed actually very quickly, but at the same time, it was, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, there's obviously something that really makes it for the UK audiences, whether it's going to be your casting or if it's going to be just the writing, uh, because it's, you know, the people who wrote in UK aren't the ones that are writing the US version, or if they are, they're only giving a little bit to it. So, mm -hmm. You know, but then again, you have something like, you know, like the Norman Lear stuff, like All in the Family. It's like, well, what is it that he's doing that was he was able to translate it? So it's not, you know, it's based on it, but it's not a duplication of it either. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, too, like, uh, am I right in thinking that British television has a lot more missing material? than say US television from that same era. Am I right or wrong in that assumption? I, th I think, uh, cause I was thinking about that too. And I, I just don't know how well you can quantify that. Um, mm -hmm. Only because, you know, what we're calling, when, when I'm working on my kaleidoscope hat, what we're calling missing also, it would include like regional programming and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. if you think about it on that level, you know, the US is so big. I don't know if you knew this, Mike, it's really big, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you can't even begin to understand how big it really is. And um, 
it's, you know, all the stuff from all of this, you know, that's been recorded over the years that have been lost, uh, you know, it's probably, it's probably still a BUS, but then you look at the different film companies that if you're looking at stuff that was broadcast on network television, you know, who knows, but then to complicate matters further, you know, all of this live material in the US and the UK, um, mm -hmm. just absolutely, um, you know, it's just, it's gone. It's gone forever. You know, the, the, especially when you think about something like, like the crater mass experiment to bring it to something that we all know, uh, you know, for years, we thought that uh, episodes three through six had been lost. But, you know, it's something that you know, the more, the more of the um, common consensus now is that it was just never recorded because the telerecording quality was so poor at the time. And it, just imagine all the stuff that we would how, how much we would just love to see those poor quality telerecordings. We had the first two episodes, how, how badly we'd love to see the next, um, the next, you know, four beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Matt, Matt Savico puts into the chat, even though it's an American production, I feel fortunate that we have the original Casino Royale with Barry Nelson as Jimmy Bond. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I mean, and, and, it's and it's that's not even complete if I'm not mistaken, right, Matt? I mean, I think that we're missing the uh, part of the last act to that, if I'm not mistaken. C correct me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, yeah, the end is missing. Uh, it's just it's really, but you'll, but it's better to have that than nothing, isn't it? And it's it's such because we all know the 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 Bond film series that it's just such a nice bit of rarity that we could see how you know someone else imagined bond and and the whole point of that was that that was going to be a whole series uh you know written and and scripts were written and stuff for it and it, it never happened uh, uh kathy puts in uh time slip and a for andromeda um i'm and kathy forgive me i because I, I i don't ever stop talking what is that in reference to um as far as um, just programs that are that have some stuff missing, I mean, because they're both they're amazing shows. They're both absolutely amazing. Uh, Time slip. We have we know there's people working on recolorizing that right now because only one episode exists in color. A for Andromeda. Uh, finally, uh, we are getting uh, getting uh, like I finally was able to hear the final episode, the audio recording of the final episode, because that had been around for a while, but no one's been able to get a hold of it. So hopefully someday, some point, there'll be another release of that so we can hear all of that uh, stuff. Speaking of missing material, um, just getting back to uh, Matt's list, you know, one of the first things that he has listed on here is Adam Adamant Lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike, have you seen any of those? No, um, that's one. That's one of my holy grails right now. I've been reading a lot about it, hearing a lot about it, uh, and so I went to Amazon.co.uk thinking, okay, I could buy the DVD set of this. And of course, it's out of production, um, and uh, you know, you could pay an exorbitant amount for it. But uh, if you're a cheapskate like me, I'm, I'm sitting here kind of wringing my hands, going, "Well, I hope they do another release of it." So, well, I mean, like no, you said, if if you were a real fan, yeah, you would have had it. Yeah, but, <laughs> I would have thought of that 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and Matt, yes, Verity was uh, was producer on that. She went from, uh, from I believe, doing from Doctor Who to Compact. Uh, I think it was Compact, the soap opera that she was leered away to, and then to the Avengers, or sorry, not the Avengers, Adam Adamant. <laughs> they both. <laughs> Well, that's right. That's the whole point. <laughs> the BBC version. And this that's kind of once again, the whole thing about the class is, um, you know, you have independent television productions that have commercial uh, commercial funding coming in so they can switch from doing videotape recording of the Avengers to series four doing film, whereas poor BBC is generally stuck with doing studio bound you know, productions, which I love, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, you know, you could tell the difference when you're trying to do something that was an attempt to move viewers away from the Avengers. It's, it's tough to, to kind of put those two together. Um, as far as Adam Adamant lives, of course, 
you have uh, the the missing audio episode, uh, the Bassardi affair that uh, Kaleidoscope had found. We only have the audio of it, which is pristine state. And right now it's, it's being worked on to be, um, to be uh, animated. And so uh, hopefully Kaleidoscope is working on that um, and hopefully some work's being done on that. But, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, Doctor Who had once again, kind of pushed the envelope and said, you know, we have these missing audios that, you know, they're not missing audios, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, you have these audios from missing programs. Why don't we see if we can recreate it with animation? And, you know, that kind of has caught on. Dad's Army had been, has an episode that had been treated the same way. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, and I think for me, uh, because Doctor Who is so easy to obtain commercially, you, you, for me at least, I sometimes get shocked into realizing, oh yeah, not everything that I would be looking for is actually released in some sort of physical format, or mm -hmm. if it is, it's out of print. You know, so it, for me, it's a, it's a, a sharp reminder that you know we're lucky to have the, the titles we do, but there's a lot out there that's never even seen an official release. It's true. At the same time, I'll have to say, um, I'm really surprised with how much is been coming out, you know, uh, stuff that you would never expect to see or never heard of until it's been announced. You know, I'm looking over at my shelf at my G through L section of the shelf and uh, I'm looking at a show called It's Dark Outside and uh, with starring Mervyn Williams and uh, I know that Anthony Ainley turns up in it and a couple other folks and it's just like, well, what's that? I never heard of that before. But it's become something that, um, you know, yeah, I watch it and I'm like, I'm so glad I have it, you know, um, or even something like I'm looking at Hancock's Half Hour. And it's like for in the UK, it's hugely known. It's a it's, you know, Tony Hancock is a household name to a certain extent, even still a pretty well known name in the UK. Over here, people are going to be like, I don't know what that is, but I guarantee you sit some people down and watch a couple episodes. They're going to think it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to uh, go to Matt in the chat, Matt in the chat. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see me or not, because I've only been seeing Mike for the last half an hour. Um, and it's, you know, it's not pleasant. You're but welcome, if, you, if you can see me, I'm holding up a Tripods uh, DVD set, because his question is, uh, regarding the two series of Tripods we got, is it's true or accurate that we have Doctor Who's cancellation to thank for it? And I have always, I mean, that was always the rumor, but I do believe that is not true. I do believe that uh, if you look at the timing of the production of the two, they don't actually correlate. And I believe um, if you if you look through some documentations, and I can certainly look through it afterwards, that it is not, it, it was always thought to be that way, um, but it wasn't. Now, I will always, uh, always refuse to watch, oh, what's the show, um, Sliders, from Fox because I still believe it's because of them that we never got a show of Doctor Who. Now, of course, that's not true either. I just don't like sliders. But um... <laughs> so, Mike, let me ask you something. Sure. How old are you? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> here's here's the question that you know we've talked about a little bit. You know, you've been a fan of British television. You've been watching stuff for a while. I know for a fact that you've been kind of doing some deeper dives. Mm -hmm. into uh, shows that maybe you wouldn't have thought about getting or, mm -hmm. or had access to. Could you name a couple of those shows that you've been kind of watching that you've been finding and, and your reaction to kind of going like underwater a little bit with this? Um, so for Christmas, I got myself a year of the sex Olympics, which- you pervert. Uh, yeah, I know I had to laugh at Greg because you know I ordered it for myself, but I wrapped it up as a present because you know you put it under the tree. So I'm unwrapping it, and it didn't occur to me until that moment that, oh yeah, my whole family is looking at me like I'm a pervert. What is this title? And you uh, got the new, you got the new BFI release, right? Yes. So, yep. so it looks like it looks like uh, the the cover is like of a floozy, basically. <laughs> She's in glitter, yep. and it's like you're the Sex Olympics, and and you have to explain, and and hopefully, you know, people that you teach at school heard about your weirdness and. <laughs> Oh, they know. It to them too. My coworkers know about my weirdness, but like it's so it's a Nigel Neal uh, story. So same author as Quatermass, and so I was really intrigued. And Greg and and Robert and others had said, "Hey, Mike, you know this is really good TV." But you guys warned me that it can mess with your head. 
And I just happened to sit down and watch it today. I thought, oh, I'll watch an episode. I didn't realize that it was- An episode is three hours long, yeah. The entire program. Uh, but once I was in, I was in. Um, and like, it's still messing with my head a few hours later. Like it's, it's very disturbing and dark and it's like 1968, 69. Um, but, yeah, 68. Yeah, but it, it really like pushes you to think about social issues. Um, so that one is just like fresh in my head. Um, and Department S, which um, I got on a fluke just because um, um, I enjoy uh, uh, Peter Wingard as an actor. Mm -hmm. Fun to watch. And so I saw Department S, it was Blu-ray and it was like fairly decently priced. And I thought, yeah, let's dive in on that. I enjoy the Avengers, I'll enjoy this. And absolutely love that show right now. Like I'm just really rocking out to it and, and depressed that they only did one series of it. And it's um, so well done, isn't it? I mean, and it, it there's hooks to it. There's a way. There's a formula to it every week, but there's hooks to it also. Yep. You know, not not to disparage the Avengers, but I find Department S more entertaining because it does. It keeps me guessing more, um, and I feel like the characters, like, like there would be times when I watch the Avengers and I feel like, oh come on, you know, Peel has got to figure this one out. You know, like they, yep. they've got to see this as a trap. Uh, and they'd walk right into something. Whereas here, it just it feel, the writing feels a little more authentic, and uh, and and so it's it's I'm, I'm finding it hugely enjoyable to watch Department S right now. Have you watched Jason King? No. So I'm hoping to to hit up on that one next, uh, just because I understand that's like a a, a sequel of sorts. A sequel. Or a, yeah. A it's a different series, but with that main character. With that character, with the Peter Weingard character, and. Unfortunately, at least to my knowledge, it's only on DVD. It's not on Blu-ray yet. Right. It's too bad, Mike. Well, it's not too bad. You got the Blu-ray, but I did have the DVD of Department S on standby for the stuff that I wanted to, uh, I have a bunch of stuff I want to give you. Department S was, was on there, actually, funny enough, wow. my old DVD. So you, you lost out, buddy. <laughs> um, a couple others in that vein that you may want to check out would be, if you haven't already, is Randall and Hopkirk, Deceased. Mm. Um, that's really good. Also, Strange Report with uh, uh, Annika Wills is in it. Oh. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really good. Uh, Matt asked the question, uh, what does the panel think about some titles only being available for streaming and not on physical media? I'm thinking about all the plays for today's that were added to BritBox recently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and as Jeff writes, uh, always a bummer, a physical media lover, a label that I think applies to all of us. It's always a little sad when something isn't made available on physical media. Now, my question to all of you, though, I thought that those were released in a recent Blu-ray set by the BFI um, that was released in October. There was a play for today's set that was released. It's a Blu-ray set because they were all film plays. And maybe there's more to this. I did see that BritBox had it. Um, so I could be completely wrong. Um, but the thing is, uh, it's, it's really tough when, you know, cause I'm, I'm happy to see something like BritBox succeeding, but at the same time I'm with Jeff. I'm, I think I'm with Matt cause I think Matt is on the same page here. Um, that it's, you know, I, I like, for some reason, I love having BritBox. Sometimes like when I want to watch Doctor Who and I have all my Doctor Who DVDs and Blu-rays over here, but I'm going to still click the button to watch it on BritBox. <laughs> the same time though, uh, you know, I love having this stuff on my shelf. I love to know it's there. I know the quality. It's, it's going to be a Blu-ray in particular. It's going to be better than what I'm going to stream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I definitely want to have you know, these, these items. And I know in the UK right now, network uh, has this thing going on with ABC television. Once again, ABC is one of those networks within the ITV network, you know, house of networks, you know, mm -hmm. its own independent company. ABC was the ones who did the Avengers mm -hmm. and network is doing the special streaming of these very old ABC programs. Now, to be fair, probably not a lot that maybe this this panel this group of us would be overly interested in but most of this stuff is not being made available to uh on on physical media so you're going to have a lot of of uh of the especially the uk archive television fans and they're just like this is ridiculous mm -hmm. um this is absolutely ri ridiculous because i want to have it on my shelf i want to watch it how i want to watch it 
-hmm. And that was also an issue with the old BBC iTunes store in the UK, because you buy this stuff, you can't, you can't download it at all. You have to watch it on their platform. Sometimes they'd get the specs wrong on it, but then you end up having, uh, you having BBC iTunes belly up and all that content you bought is now gone. So you're kind of, you're kind of screwed. Uh, for me, uh, I've been using, cause I held out on BritBox for the longest time cause I'm a physical media person myself. Um, and eventually we got it cause my wife enjoys watching some of the, you know, mystery shows on there. So I was like, Oh, okay. Um, but what I've found really useful for me is to, like be able to go back either to a program that I kind of vaguely remember and want to like reacquaint myself with or something brand new that I want to check out. Like I started a, an episode or two of the thick of it because I'd always heard good things about it. But I was like, well, I don't know if I really want to buy it if I haven't seen it yet. Um, and so being able to watch the first couple episodes, yep. After the first couple episodes, I stopped streaming and I was like, no, nope, I'm going to order this because I, I'm enjoying it so much. Uh, so for me, BritBox, has been helpful in dabbling to decide if I want to make the purchase. Well, and Matt also brings up a really good point too. I mean, cause that is, that is a very, very good idea too, Mike, to be able to like, it's kind of a tester for us physical media folks, but mm -hmm. uh, Matt is saying, you know, his hubby addicted to Gardner's world and you're not gonna find Gardner's world, you know, as Blu-ray sets, you're gonna be, but you know, you're gonna be able to watch it. You're also gonna be able to get the newest episodes of EastEnders and I think Coronation Street might still be on there if, if you're into that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Corey is a pretty deep and wide addiction to develop, says Jeff. I have a hard drive full of every episode of Coronation Street and I've, I Ooh. do not, do not want to get go I don't want to go there <laughs> it's one of those things it's just nice to have but not no I can't <laughs> um but uh you know that's just it and you know it's also interesting kind of in a similar vein you have folks in the UK get upset you know the archive television fans who get upset that say something like a Blu-ray release of House of Cards or a Blu-ray release of Miss Marple, the BBC version, mm -hmm. is out over here in the US, but it's not out in the UK. Yep. And it's because BBC Home Entertainment in the US, Bill, because they're just like, you know, they're like, oh, House of Cards on Netflix is coming out. Let's have something that maybe we could sell that people would be interested in. And mm -hmm. you got that. Or the fact that Agatha Christie's Poirot is completely out in Blu-ray, completely remastered in the US through Acorn Media, but it's released in the UK on Acorn Media and it doesn't have a Blu-ray release. In fact, I think it's interesting to note, I think in terms of television, we're kind of, I'm kind of surprised with how little actually is on Blu-ray in the UK when you, mm -hmm. when you really think about it. It's getting better. I, th I, I think the situation has gotten a lot better over the past, uh, two, three years. I mean, especially with something like the release of Python, you know, being up converted to, you know, HD, which in my opinion, the Monty Python set is even above Doctor Who, probably my favorite archive television release of all time, because it's just Doctor Who is, is it's wonderful ongoing, you know, collection of, of, you know, restoration and putting so much out there, but my goodness, um, it's, Python is, it's just a labor of love. Um, and Bill says, I remember Steve Roberts saying a few years back at Galley that TV shows don't sell well in the UK. And it's probably, I, I, and you know, Bill, I, I'm thinking that it still might be true, but you know, I, I suppose the archive television fans, that certain segment of fans, maybe, maybe that is something that is, they understand that target and they're able to make the numbers work. And although contrary to what you know, the people restoring it might say they still get paid for their work, but I bet that they're, they're charging a lot less than they probably should so that they can have an opportunity to, um, to do this. And one of the, you know, great point on that is uh, Peter Crocker, who did, uh, does all the restoration for Doctor Who. He created the Vidfire. He works with, you know, the team on the Chroma Dot, you know, all this, all that work. He offered for free to the BFI to uh, do a, you know, a, a restoration for year of the sex Olympics. And uh, they, they didn't do it. Um, and I think that they were going to try to do a chroma dot 
uh, recovery on it. But according to um, uh, Dick Fitty, that they didn't have they didn't have a ton of chromodots. Like I don't know what what state the print was in, but it didn't have. It, it didn't have a full set of uh, throughout, it wasn't consistent or something throughout the print. I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, but also the, 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 the show was released in 2000 on DVD originally and or 2001. And this is a different, uh, different print than what was released. This is a print that was actually uh, scanned in HD. So it, it is, it is better. It is, it is, there is more work done to it, but obviously there could have been more. And that's a real bummer because how often are we going to see this program released? And to your point, Mike, it's great television, but how often do we want to watch it? <laughs> when, it <laughs> when you're just sitting there kind of shaking on your couch, just like what just happened? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's a valid point. Cause I was watching, thinking about the chroma dot recovery, color recovery going, gosh, it would have been great if they had done that because you're right like it's a great program but it's going to be a while before i pop it back in and watch it especially the last half hour no spoilers yes. um yeah. <laughs> but yeah let, well, i'm kind of lost my train of thought here too where where i was going sorry that's that's okay that's okay because i wasn't listening either no i'm just kidding you were just talking about how you know you were thinking about the chroma dot recovery Actually, but a, a different idea that was popping into my head, because I know you're the guy that kind of pushed me into this as well, you know, because I'm thinking for anyone watching the panel, you know, you might, they might have BritBox, but a lot of the, uh, outside of that, a lot of the UK titles may be in the UK only, and not mm -hmm. really available in a US format. Um, and so, like, I know that you convinced me to go with a region-free, like, Blu-ray player which to me like really opened up the catalog. Like I, I was then able to purchase titles that were available in the UK, but had never been converted and published or, or, or put into production in the US. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, can you speak to that a little bit? Like how difficult is it to find a region free player? Cause it sounds kind of intimidating. I know when you first were telling me, I was like, gosh, I don't know how I'd even spot one and how, where would I find it and how expensive is it? Like how difficult is it to get a region free player? It, it's not it's not difficult at all uh depending on how good you want it to be that's where you're going to spend more money you know if you go to worldimports.com or something like that uh mm -hmm. like i have i have two oppo players they're very high-end uh blu-ray players i have to switch the region every time i switch between a and b as matt put in the comments not everything is region locked and it looks like that the doctor who stuff blu-rays are becoming less and less region locked uh, but you know, network still tends to region lock stuff like they did a region A and a region B, uh, or actually they did a PAL and NTSC, uh, for lack of better terms, it's not quite true of the Monty Python set. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it's becoming more and more, it's easier to find than it was before, especially when it comes to Blu-ray DVDs have become very easy to find lock, but you know, you just got to do your research and see what other people are thinking about different models and, and stuff, because you're going to, it's easy to find if people think that something is easy to use or not. Um, but it is, it, you know, it's becoming easier to find these, these programs and, and these, these sets that are, um, done. I uh, just wanted to move back real fast. Bill had a question about, uh, are there many shows other than Doctor Who that have had chroma dot recovery done? And I think, um, I think Robert hit it pretty much in the head. We know, are you being served? The pilot had, um, had uh, been chroma dot recovered. Dad's Army, the episode called Room at the Bottom, had been, had a chroma dot recovery to it. There is an episode of a series called Red Cap, um, uh, that had uh, chroma dot recovery done to them. There's a couple others that I seem to be blanking on, but you know, especially like something like "Are You Being Served?" That pilot that was huge um, to get done because it was one of those shows that you know had been forever, you know, stuck in the world of black and white, uh, even though it was broadcast in color. And as Robert said, still not released, though that is on BritBox. Uh, to watch the color version of it. Uh, the color version of Room at the Bottom for Dad's Army is on Netflix. Uh, and I think BritBox has Dad's Army now, doesn't it? I believe it does. Yeah. I, if they have, I think they might even have the animated episode on They it. do. 
they do Stripe for Frasier, mm -hmm. and uh, which is done by the same people who did Power of the Daleks, because mm -hmm. uh, it was the project right before they did Power of the Daleks. And <laughs> for what it's worth, I do a podcast. I interviewed Martin Garrity, who worked on both of them. If you're interested in listening to such things, uh, <laughs> but it's a real, to be very honest, it's a real interesting uh, story about how honest he is about how he's he wasn't nobody was terribly happy with the outcome of both the dad's army and the original power of the daleks because they didn't have the time um they were being pressed constantly by the bbc let's hurry it up let's hurry it up you know it this will take you know i'm just throwing out numbers this will take us you know eight months to do okay well you have you know five months you know it's just stuff like that that really makes it makes it tough and it almost makes you almost kills a project successfully before it even gets out there unfortunately but luckily luckily it didn't and fans were very enthusiastic about the doctor who stuff for sure so do you have certain titles like you asked me a few of the deep dives i've done and and i've often done a deep dive based on some of your recommendations like what would you for someone who's fresh into this what are some must have or must see those title series that that you think really are kind of like the epitome of British television. I don't know if you can see me because honestly, all I've been seeing, I'll I'll show is is you, Mike, and that's fine. You're 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 a good looking young man, um, <laughs> but I'm holding up the Blu-ray to uh, uh, Quatermass in the Pit, and mm -hmm. I I believe, in my opinion, this is my I think this is one of the best pieces of British television ever made. Um, it was. It's, it's a wonderful piece of live television, as well as a lot of inserts, film inserts that were done on a level that you just didn't see done on for television at that time. You know, like we talked earlier, um, a lot of British, a lot of BBC television was kind of stuffy plays that were like, you're just in the audience. This was so complex and so revolutionary for its time. And it was made to really show the people who are starting to go over to watch the ITV programs, like, hey, look at us, you know, we're, we can do amazing television, you know? And, and I think that the design of like the Martians, the design of the sets, everything holds up so well, even though, and I was gonna say, even though it's in black and white, and I know better than that. Um, the I mean, fact that it's a nice it makes it. Production. Like it's it makes it. Television, it's early television but they do it so well it it, it totally makes the production mm -hmm. and i would i would really urge people it's tough because uh they released this and they only released on blu-ray the uh the the one the, the third of the you know the bbc3 uh Corey mass in the pit i really wish that they would have put the other two on there. So it's like, this is the original release on DVD up from the BBC, has all three uh, stories on it. And what um, what's really interesting about this is like you have a documentary on here called, or just a little uh, piece on here, it's, I think it's called Making Demons. And it's, it's Making Demons Visual Effects Featurette. What's interesting about this is that it's Jack Kinney and uh, gosh, I can't think of the name of the other guy. And they're just talking about how they made uh, the, the, the Martians and stuff for this in 1984 and all that stuff. The funny thing about it is that that is part of a three to four hour shoot that I wish more would have made it on here because there is a whole section of them at the TARDIS console that they, because they're all in the effects house and they're trying to get it to work. And it's the season, you know, it's the five doctors council and they keep pushing it really hard. And you're just like, stop it. You're going to ruin it. Uh, but you know, it's just like, it's really, it's like, that's the fun stuff that I really wish that they would have put on here. And I'm going to be doing a video, a comparison video, review video of this. I'm going to put some of that on there so that people can kind of see a little bit of that. Um, to me, that is like all the Quater Masses, and I'm not going to say anything Nigel Neal makes is the best stuff ever. I mean, we have Kinvig, um, but, uh, you know, that stuff, and it really depends on what you're into also. If you don't like science fiction, this may not be the right thing for you. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, something like uh, Dr. Finley's casebook is also kind of fun. Uh, you know, uh, I'm always a fan of Steptoe and Son. Like I mentioned, Hancock's Half Hour is good. I mean, there's just so many. It really depends on what you're into. Um, 
and uh, I don't know. It's 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 really it's really pretty cool. Um, and so Robert just asked, where can I find out what does and doesn't exist in these UK archives? And and Bill, I'm going to get to your question in a second. Um, there is there is a, uh, a Kaleidoscope does this page, and it's um, it's called TV Brain. And they, they have this amazing uh, database that they put together over, working with the ITV archives, the BBC archives, um, which I've had, I've had uh, tours of both those places and they're absolutely amazing. And they have these close relationships with, with Kaleidoscope and it's a subscription. Um, but if you're really into it, I mean, there's other places to find this information out too, but this literally has not only like the, the what's what's a, what exists and what doesn't, but it also has like the videotape numbers of the master tapes, you know, stuff like that that just you know blows my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome actually. It's called TV Brain www.tvbrain.info. It's twenty pounds a year if you want to do it. Otherwise, there's plenty of places you you can look. Also, if you want to go to LostTVShows.com, which is also Kaleidoscope, it's kind of a reverse. It only tells you what's missing, doesn't tell you what exists. But you're gonna get a kind of an idea of what's what's missing. Um, and Bill, you know, you asked, what do you think of British television documentaries like World at War? Phenomenal, right? I mean, Mike, have you watched any of that stuff? Oh gosh, it's been years and years. I think because I think that was one that was on PBS. If I it sure was. Series. Yeah. Yep. If if Jason Tucker was on here, one thing he would he would bring up would be uh, that that uh, both Robert and I have watched is this Thames Television documentary called Hollywood, and <laughs> it's about the early days of Hollywood, and it is was made in the eighties, and it was one of these things that is so, I mean, you have interviews with people who are long gone, they gave insight. I mean, it's, it's I think a 12, 10 or 12 part documentary. It is phenomenal. It is absolutely like it's definitive. I mean, it's just this wonderful piece of, of television. Um, so yes, I think, I think so many of their documentaries are great. We're running out of time, Mike. Yes, we are. So we got like maybe five minutes left. What, what kind of topics? We you hoping to talk about today that or tonight that we haven't touched on yet? I mean, I've I've just loved the organic flow of it. I'm hoping that everyone out there had fun also. Um, I kind of I just want to kind of I just want to kind of let people know if uh, you're interested in uh, seeing what I post and stuff. One of the things I love to post on my social media channels are listings and stuff from the radio times and the tv times i have all issues of both so i always take stuff and i post it and i post it to twitter on my twitter account is at from the archive and also on facebook you can find me at facebook.com forward slash from the archive mn um, and then from there you'll see links to stuff that i do whether it be podcast or uh or uh, uh blog related also uh this weekend i am recording uh Kevin McNally talking about the missing Hancocks as well as dad's army, as well as people who worked on the production side of those. I also have a uh, interview with uh, Mike Berry, who is in Are You Being Served? So these, we're gonna have podcasts coming out here hopefully soon. And uh, Mike, anything you wanna promote while we still have a little bit of time? Uh, so other than your work, because like, honestly, if you're, if you're not sure what the next great British title is that you'd like to dive into, Looking at Greg's podcast, listening to uh, his audio casts or his podcasts or, or um, watching him on YouTube, any of those will give you like great insight uh, or even reading his blog. Like there have been a number of shows that I've picked up on just because Greg mentioned it. And I was like, you know, we got to check that out. So it really is worth the time to, to take a look at. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Mike, for joining in with me on this. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It's fun. I always love talking about stuff. So it is it is That's fun. And thank you all very much for watching us today and hope you enjoy the all the other great panels on uh, Council Room. Mm -hmm.